when we look at the existing health crisis and uh, COVID-19 and people ask you what is it that's going to change in the world in relation to that, I think we have to be a little bit circumspect about being, being, saying that the whole world is going to transform because of it. I think we need to give that a little bit of time. Certainly in terms of people's health and well-being and buildings, we need to consider them quite carefully. But our, our understanding of the infection is still at the sort of uh, fairly basic stage at the moment. And I think, think, think people shouldn't jump to conclusions. If, if you have a sense of history, I think you see COVID in the context of human evolution and the last thousand years. It's a version of ev evolutionary normality. It's not a special um, imposition on this generation. And therefore, um, you have to get your both your, your psyche and your civilization around it and over it and to manage it in that way. In the context of it, it's causing a huge amount of claustrophobia. And I think architects should be available, ready, vocal about being, being able to answer people's questions when they come out of it. People will be really focused on, on the difficulty of where they live and its, and its lack of facilities in a way that they never have been before. Short-term solutions for problems can also lead to problems in themselves. If we make residential spaces too small and too limited, then when time comes when you have to spend three months in a particular place, you need a window to open out to a balcony. You need to be able to see nature that nature is an integral part of the architectural situation. You know, when you're in the situation of COVID and you're in your own house, you appreciate what you have, if you have a garden, if you have enough space. It does make you realise that it is so important to provide everyone else with those things. I think it's a time of enormous potential to re-evaluate uh, the basic values that have been imposed or that we have been exercising, let's say. It, it brings us forward rather than back to seriously thinking about the, the fact that we are biological beings. We need sunshine. We need to see the sky. We need a window. We need fresh air. We need to be able to be private and we need to be able to retreat. We need each other. We're biological beings. One of the saddest things is to see the cities empty now because we had relied so much on the office worker to inhabit the city centre. The primary lesson from the COVID pandemic is that there aren't anything like enough people living in the centre of Dublin uh, to sustain the local businesses. The tourist economy collapsed. Um, many of the businesses indeed were dependent on the tourist economy. Uh, that went out the door. Office workers started working from home, thus depriving, you know, cafes and uh, sandwich shops and all the rest of it of their business. The place was thronged with, with tourists every day and every night. Um, and that's something that is a bit surreal about it now. You know, it's so quiet. My God, it's so quiet. The pressure we're finding ourselves under with COVID and almost what seems to be a retreat from the city, it's doubly, trebly, quadruply important that we proclaim our own belief in the credibility of the city and the necessity for the city to thrive. We're trying to plan for 2050 and beyond and what will Dublin look like and you know as a local authority how do we try um, and put buildings and spaces here that will help people grow over the next 20, 30, 40 years. The city's been challenged and questioned you know will people be working, will we be shopping, you know who will be living but in a sense it makes then the need for civic and public investment and confidence. It's why people come to cities, is to gather. Cities have developed through a time when there has been um, the presence of infectious disease all the time. And many cities have bound around in their, their form and their history issues which relate to infectious disease. 
People tended to leave the city when there was contagion, but one thing for sure is they always came back afterwards. So this idea that we're all going to empty ourselves out of the countryside and live semi-virtual lives in a state of nature assisted by technology is not something that I would necessarily agree with. It somehow heightens the basic needs of human beings, which has always been at the basis of architecture. That's not new. It's not new. Uh, Alberti in the 15th century, the great humanist, talked about exactly the same things. So it's, the, it's at the core of architecture. So in a sense, you could say that it's a time to highlight the essential qualities of architecture. I do think that COVID has made us more aware that we are creatures of nature and that nature enriches our lives. It's not just something that you kind of obliterate and it's a pity we have to knock down all these forests because we've got to build housing. You can integrate nature into design. I think COVID would give us an opportunity to think in a new way about spaces and, and nature and where people travel and how they interrelate with each other and architects should be there with answers and ideas now as to how that's going to be and in some ways even to excite and support people by those ideas now thinking about something good could come out of this in the future. I believe there's something quite central to human nature which has got to do with physical contact. It's got to do with smell, eye contact, touch, the, you know, the, the sixth sense you have when you're in a room with somebody. By being with them, by gestures and expressions and body language across the table, the way in which families come together and the kind of ache that most people have had for touch and connection over these last few months. To me, that's something that shouldn't be forgotten about. I think it's going to be absolutely central to, you know, we are human animals, and the idea of us being independent minds communicating through virtual technology, I don't think is a believable idea. I think fundamentally we'll want to revert back to issues of closeness, to material contact, to touch, and to being together in communities. And as soon as we can, we'll do that. It's really the job for architects and for other people to find ways to do it safely. We live in a time of a pandemic, we live with COVID. And in a sense, it, it, it came as a phenomenal shock to us because we had got so, we thought we were invincible, I suppose. I live in the Liberties on Cork Street. Cork Street was a, a two lane street and from photographs, you know, it had very attractive buildings, some of which survived. A road widening line was put in place for Cork Street in mid-1940s. So slowly in the 1970s, that street was destroyed, basically. But it has tremendous attractions and has tremendous character that in a sense is awaiting to be revealed. Cork Street is a very historic street in the city. In the middle of the street, you have the Cork Street Fever Hospital, the lawn area in front of it, with this beautiful clock tower. The Quaker burial ground opposite and the James Weir nurses home. So it's a fantastic ensemble. Cork Street Fever Hospital was built between 1801 and 1804. It was designed by Samuel Johnson and the building came about as the result of some lobbying. There was a committee set up about 1801 of kind of, you know, worthy Dublin businessmen, merchants. So there was Arthur Guinness, there was David Latouche, the banker, Samuel Bewley, the Quaker, 
You have to remember at this time, Dublin was being ravaged by a pandemic. Cholera and typhus was rife. The Cork Street Fever Hospital becomes a central point and it was a particular part of the city that was affected by these diseases because of poor hygiene levels and the crowding within the city. They wanted to bring the state-of-the-art architecture for health to what was a kind of disease-ridden part of Dublin city. And it's a huge site, you know, it's a four acre, a 1.6 hectare site. It was an orchard. It was sold by a widow by the name of Mrs. Donnelly. The pavilion type of architecture that Cork Street is built in was really expensive because you needed a lot of land. So they cleared the orchard and actually put the building there to create that distance between the sick and the convalescing. The Cork Street Fever Hospital is a very elegant building. When you look at it face on, it's a symmetrical building. You have the two flanking pavilions that are exactly matched and this long, thin corridor that basically connects them. And to give it its full name, it's the Cork Street Fever Hospital and House of Recovery. They looked at best practice for fever hospitals throughout this island and in Britain. The East Pavilion, which was for people who had a fever. The clock tower is in the middle, and then on the western side is the House of Recovery. Hospital design changes as medical theory adapts and changes. So in the 19th century, the hospital design was based around miasmic theory. Disease and illness can be spread through the air. This is how people were getting sick. So it's also why there's two separate buildings, two separate pavilions. There's the east and the west that are connected by a long corridor. The east side was where the actively sick were housed and the west side was where the, those that were convalescing or recovering. So it was an early form of containment and control and being hygienic. They didn't quite know the theories that we have today, but they were bang on the money because we're kind of seeing that now with COVID. We're, we're trying to keep distance and air and ventilation and it's something that they were doing in the 19th century in the Cork Street Fever Hospital. In these days of COVID and the need for proper ventilation, that was one of their key design features. So in the wards, they started to move patients further and further away from each other in case that disease and illness would spread between them. And that's why you see a lot of windows in the Cork Street Fever Hospital. They wanted that ventilation through the building. They wanted the air to move the sickness through the building and outside. They saw the air as healing. These later buildings that are almost hermetically sealed that you're trapped inside almost. There's no air, there's no connection to the outside. Whereas these early hospitals use nature, they use fresh air, and you were connected to your surroundings by the sheer fact that you could open the windows. The Cork Street Fever Hospital played a critical role in the famine, the Great Famine in Ireland, and in, I think it was 1847, in, in a 10-month period, uh, 14,000 patients were admitted with the dreaded famine fever. And there were so many patients uh, that they had to use the grounds to accommodate them in tents. Now that we're living through a global pandemic, the architecture of this building is a shining example of the simple way that we can care for ourselves, care for others through architecture. There are so many things that could and should be done regarding the fever hospital and its grounds. And one of them is publicising it, communicating its history, its huge history, and also to arrange it so that people could have access into the grounds and to start experimenting with that. Poolbeg Power Station is a vast red brick electricity generating station that began its life in 1902. The power station that was built there was quite a utilitarian red brick structure comprising a relatively long boiler house and against it a, a turbine hall or an engine room. 
There was a very tall red brick chimney stack at the south end of the power station. In the landscape of warehousing and large scale industrial buildings, it's gorgeous. It's got detail and complexity that keep you interested. It's not because it's Victorian. It's not because it's big. It's significant because of what the building did and what it represents. The building is power generation in Ireland for 100 years. We don't have that much industrial heritage of a large scale, and this is as large as it gets in this country. So to see it and a couple of the elements on it that make it spectacularly different from other buildings gets people excited, curious, and everyone walks away going, oh, I had totally different ideas what it, what it was about. The power station you see today is very different to how it would have been when it was fully operational. The place would have been teeming with workmen from the locality. It would have been at the beating heart of Rings End and this part of the city of Dublin. When the building was built first, it was three bays of brick warehouse with a large chimney. Besides the scale, it was quite simple. When you first approach the building, you see the three gables and the chimney in front of you. The chimney is quite a tall chimney, but originally that was 200 feet tall. The three brick gables are quite ornate, they're quite beautiful, they're very Victorian. You have a Venetian-style three-bay window in one of the gables that would suit any posh country house of its time. The building was there because of the dock and the pier. When the ships would come, they'd unload the coal onto the pier. Conveyor belts would bring the coal up the side of the building, up onto the hulking great steel structure, which housed the hoppers, storing the coal, dropping them into the generators below. So that first bay, burning the coal. The second bay, that's the engine room, creating steam. And the third bay is about transferring that steam into electricity and transporting it away. The engine room contains a whole complex network of vast reinforced structures which would have supported the turbines that powered the electricity generation. The turbines are gone, but these structures still remain. It has almost like a post-apocalyptic quality to it when you're in the building. The control room was built in about 1945. It's a super modernist oval-shaped room, white glass ceiling set within a steel grid. it still has the power to think, well, this was cutting edge. What's even more fascinating is above that wonderful white glass ceiling, you have a roof light, pure Victorian design, traditional joinery methods to put it together. That's pretty much happens throughout the building, the high tech and the traditional together fighting with new technology. At the east end of the power station was built a two-storey structure that is probably the most decorative and most elaborate part of the original building. It was to house offices, but also the switchgear rooms and all of the mechanics needed to transform and convert the power into electricity. The building was likely designed by engineers because it was to house machinery, and it would have been the expertise of the machinery that informed the building. All the kit was coming from Scotland, and it was about creating a space big enough to house that. From an architecture point of view, it is a basic big shed with some lovely flourishes. It's an English bond machine-made brick building, which again would be beautiful wherever you put it. It has a few little details that just bring a bit of design and Victorian formality. The Pigeon House power station was decommissioned in the 1970s, replaced by the oil-powered power station right beside it with the two large distinguished chimneys which are now iconic to Dublin. The fact that the Pigeon House power station lost its chimney that was nearly 200 foot high is the only reason why it's not as well known as its younger neighbour next door. There's something breathtaking about the power station. What can be more dramatic than this cathedral to electricity generation situated nearly three kilometres into the bay? That whole peninsula, it's, it's always been the backyard of Dublin and it's too special an area to have as an afterthought. 
This building changed the country, changed how we live our lives. It gave us street lighting, it gave us shift work, it gave us electricity in the home. That's its value and that's why it needs to be retained. Article 4121 of our Constitution says that by her life within the home, woman gives to the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. And Article 4122, to ensure that mothers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect of their duties in the home. It was to be a new College of Domestic Science. The skills that were taught in the very first curriculum in the college included art, needlework, laundry, dressmaking, dress design, housewifery, cooking, but it also included institutional and hotel work. The brief was heavily influenced by the conservative and patriarchal society of the time and supported by the Catholic Church. So the building was designed by Robinson and Keefe. They had established a practice in 1925. It is a quietly dignified urban block. If you just stand and look, what appears to be quite low key initially, shines with quality. Look at the brickwork, look at the patterns, look at the stonework, look at the beautiful curves. Look at how it sits into the streetscape. It's wonderful. If you look at the decorative glazing in the main entrance, it's playful and it's beautiful and it's very Art Deco. And it does contrast with the very solid, functional timber windows into the classrooms. But that contrast I find very appealing. The single bay at each corner of the building on Cahill Street is curved at ground floor level and splayed on the upper floors between two projecting pilasters with a curved projecting shelf at the first floor sill level and that supports the stone carving of the Three Graces on the northwest corner. If you're walking down O'Connell Street, um, you, you, you start with the O'Connell Monument um, at O'Connell Bridge and you pass a number of statues of men on pedestals and if you keep going you'll arrive at Parnell at the north end of the street but if you turn off into Carl Brewer Street you will see these three young women. For all the world I wish they were on a building, for example on O'Connell Street because where they are, nobody sees them. People don't look up. Gabriel Hayes is the sculptor who's responsible uh, for the sculpture on the facade of the building. There were to be two originally, but only one was carried out. She got the commission when she was working on probably her most important commission, the uh, reliefs on the facade of what was then the Department of Industry and Commerce on Kildare Street. Women in art had uh, an uphill battle getting recognised. Her male peers were the ones who were best known. She's in competition with them to get particular commissions and finally she beats them. But she's still not getting proper recognition. The writing about her is, is horrendous, I think. I mean, it's so, so, so insulting. When she was doing the Kildare Street work, there's a photograph of her in the paper. She's working in hanging scaffolding on the building and the headline over it is, Woman Sculptor Gets Big Task. Mm. <laughs> She's a very strong and powerful sculptor, but there's a great sensitivity in it also the three young women. 
represent different aspects of domestic science. So one woman has a sewing kit and she's, she's sewing. The one standing in the middle, she has a book in her hand, which is presumed to be uh, a recipe book. And the most wonderful of them with the brush because she's just looking out into space and she's dreaming, you know, she's not concentrating on what she should be doing at all. Very strong figure. One of the things that's particularly interesting about them is what they depict. Portrait statues uh, in the city, almost all men. And when women do appear, it's an allegorical figure or a mythological figure, not someone who existed in real life being commemorated. So this is real life. When you move into the building, it's like a big stately liner. The balustrades in stainless steel and hardwood, they're beautifully designed. They swoop with glee. You've got a lot of spectacular use of Irish marbles, wonderful use of terrazzo. And what's really striking in this building is how well these materials have survived. In my opinion, good architecture is architecture that lasts. So it has a, a timeless quality. It has performed well. It still looks amazing. And it still is a useful building. And it plays a really important role in our city. It is now part of our architectural heritage. We can learn from buildings like this. In relation to the opening of the building in 1941, I want to read this quote from the Archbishop of Dublin at the time, John Charles McQuaid. He said, I'm glad to bless this house because its work will reach to the foundations of human society. Here, in fact, will be trained the women who will assist in building happy homes, for here will be imparted right knowledge and practice of the home craft. It's confirming this idea at the time that women stay in the home and not compete with men in the workplace. A piece of sculpture by a woman whose profession was to be a sculptor. She had a family, she had a husband, she had children. She functioned in the home the same as anybody else, but she had a job to do. This building is of its time. The ethos was to educate women primarily for their work in the home, but times have changed. I love buildings. <laughs> That's why I'm an architect. The philosophy of the practice and of all of our work that we're doing, um, I think we like to make architecture which is about the people, the clients that we're building for, and about the places that they live. Great buildings don't get built without great clients. The clients, John and Louise, invited me to the site and uh, it was kind of a magical place. All of the kind of character and life that had accumulated over years was still left in the place. It was one of these old buildings you find that's very captivating. Very humble, certainly, but also captivating at the same time. Whenever we're starting a project, you know, there's that kind of initial excitement, right? Like kind of setting off on this journey and, and as soon as you visit a site, your mind is spinning and you're thinking of all different approaches. Everyone, everyone's drawn to ruins, right? Everyone recognizes immediately their kind of beauty and their mystery, but I think oftentimes people don't know what to do with them. People either do one of two things. They let them disappear into the ground or they knock them down and build new. And I don't think we have to choose an either-or 
here. I think we can choose a third way, and this building is a demonstration of a third way to approach these historic farmsteads. We can maintain them, we can maintain their character, we can keep as much of their authenticity alive and present, and we can add to them. We can, we can add a new building adjacent to them, in amongst them, that adds to the farmstead in the same way that it has always historically been added to. The character of the, of the house is still as present as we could make it, I suppose. The original cottage, the sheds, are as present as we could make them in the house as we find it now. You know, the lives of the client's great, great, great grandmother is right there through the bedroom window. When we view the house from the outside, it's clear that it is both modern and traditional at the same time. It looks like the farmhouse, but it's somehow different than it at the same time. And when you come inside then, it was about this feeling of a kind of discovery, like a joy of discovering each room. And so we didn't erase anything. We didn't try to strip back to some pure ideal form of a farmhouse. It was, no, it was this farmhouse. It was these elements which were meaningful. The cast iron stove, which was used for God knows how many years, is still sitting there in the fireplace. The children's bedroom is, uh, I really enjoy because it's so unexpected to walk into a kind of narrow hallway that you enter into and then you're into the, the children's bedroom and suddenly the, the roof springs away from you, right? And then all of a sudden it gets very high and there's this, just this little lovely little triangle there that you might not have noticed on the way in. My other favorite space in the house is, is the hallway. And really, again, it's tied to light and this feeling of discovery. And so the tented roof comes along it, down the hallway and then suddenly it flips up and light comes in and drifts in and, and makes that whole part of the hallway glow. I want to make buildings which relate very directly to the places where they are and to the buildings which have come before them and to the cultures that they can connect with. I think that's the only way to make meaningful buildings is for them to have, reach out in a way and pull all these things into them. It's a kind of con a very contextual approach and it's ultimately about yeah, the culture that we all live in. I think it's important for people thinking about architecture or training in architecture to be very open to history, to stand on the shoulders of the people who have come before you. It's, a, it's an environmental imperative, really, that we build less, that we demolish less, that we reuse more. And so finding uses and aesthetics and forms out of what we find already in existence is going to be the central job of the architect going forward. We're always trying to find a way to add incrementally, to reimagine the thing that is there, to give it a new life somehow, in a way which is, I suppose, more creative than destructive. To be a good trader, you have to be nice to people and you have to be gentle and kind. Whether they pull your stuff around or not, or do this, that, and the other, you have to be say, and you're all right, love, go on, leave it. Well, you just get the same people coming in every day and they'd come up to you. Some of them wouldn't buy anything at all, but you just have a chat. It was good crack, yeah, yeah, it was, definitely. Man, I read you by the side for six bob five, here for three and a half a crown, two bob. I remember going into the market from an early age. It was always great fun. It was always like lots of banter and uh, long established families running stalls. The time I remember most was when I was about eight years old. I actually went in on my own and I negotiated for a beautiful suit, which was Prince of Wales check. And there was a bit of bartering. I felt very grown up came back home that day very happy. Great-great-grandfather, Edward Cecil Guinness, he'd taken on the brewery which was passed down to him. He was really keen for social purpose. I think he was very alive to the people's lives, you know, and how maybe he was so lucky, but the others were less fortunate. You know, there was a lot of deprivation. Can you imagine, like, trading on the streets in those days? At that time, they were out in hail, rain and snow. 
We did all sorts of social improvement schemes throughout Dublin. The hostel for the homeless and St Patrick's Park. The market was all part of that same purpose, you know, to lift up the lives of the people of the Liberties. The markets were established by Act of Parliament. The Ivy Markets Act was 1904 and it was uh, passed on and then managed by the local Dublin authorities. To be brought into such a, a great building like the Ivy Market and just, you know, have running water, make a cup of tea, you know, electricity, you'd have everything where um, they would have had nothing on the street. It must have been fantastic. They used to tell us all the stories about Lord Ivy taking them off of the stones when we were kids. The stones, they called it them, they called them footpaths now. Looking at the building in front of you, up the granite steps and then the figures on the outside depict all these traders from around the world. Wouldn't it necessarily have been in his typical character to do a cheeky wink, but you never know. It just could be my great-great-grandfather. The architect's name was Hicks. The Ivy Market has so many hallmarks of great-great-grandparents' favoured architecture and style. It was all very carefully considered. You'd walk through the wrought iron gates and into this big old hall. And um, there was a gallery, it was on a very tall ceiling, so it was quite a big space inside. And it was organised as two spaces. One was the market to serve the people for household goods. And then the other one was the area for the food and drink. And then he organised a washing area, basically, where clothes could be washed. and. You know, and that itself was uh, a very popular and social pastime in the days before washing machines and things. So it was really uplifting people's lives. My father sold buttons in the ivy market. I went into the ivy with my mother because I was kind of always with her, you know, so we had to stall at the side. And she used to sell toys and ornaments and all stuff like that. I had rails of clothes. I started the rail when I went into it. Everything used to get through on the counter. And then I started, me and my daughter started bringing in rails and that. My sister sold in the middle part and I was at the side. From my sister down was all the second-hand clothes. And then there was a couple of people selling vegetables there. That was, so you went down the steps and um, out into the fish market. The roof was primarily tiled and it's got sort of wooden um, skylights, if you like, and um, glass panels. Beautiful big uh, metal columns through the middle of the building. A lovely balcony going all around it. But now the antique dealers and all used to keep that stuff up there. It's a magnificent building. But um, again, they weren't nothing, the markets without the people that were the stallholders and the whole community that loved and enjoyed and relished the place. It was like we were all one big family in the Ivy Market. They were all nice people, really and truly, and they'd help you out if you need it, you know, that way. So towards the end, the, the rent, we say, on the bigger stalls went from 17 pounds to 34 pound. So like, everyone knew they were trying to get us out at this stage. We were to go into the office on such a day. I'd work going to show the film. Now, this is what the Ivy Market is going to be like. And you're going to have a special place for fruit and a special place for meat and a special dish. Everything was special. But I didn't realise at the time that it was all lies we were told. And look at all the years now, it's lying idle, and we still never got back into the market. My experience of the markets from a personal capacity is living in the area for the last 23 years. 
and just seeing this incredible building over time just, you know, becoming more and more and more run down. As I understand it, the rights to develop the, the building were, were granted um, to a certain individual and that he had a certain amount of time in which to exercise the planning permission. So the dispute arose as to whether or not the planning permission had actually been enacted or not. And the result is that it's being fought out in the courts. It's gone horrible now. They've just let it go, like, completely, you know? That was the heart of the liberties that they took away from us, the Ivy Martha. When it came to Lord Ivy's attention that the markets had you know, collapsed into this state of disrepair, but also that it was now tied up in this legal wrangle, he exercised a clause in the original contract or the original um, terms of his bequeathing this to the council and to the city, which was that if, the, uh, if, if, if there was a risk that the markets would, would not actually be used in the intentions that he had you know, set out, um, or that there was a, in a, they, they were at risk, that he could rescind that arrangement. Um, so he enacted that, and, uh, and hence we saw the occupation um, just before Christmas last year. Paul Smithick, who represents Lord Ivy in Ireland, arrived to a hero's welcome from residents of the Liberties. He said the Lord decided to act once he became aware of the legal impasse. Lord Ivy has taken possession and changed the locks. This is like your wildest dreams, you know? This is just, you know, number one, fair play to Lord Ivy. I mean, a Lord occupying a building, you know, <laughs> make of that what you will. There are various technical constraints, if you like, that great-great-grandfather put into the constitution of the Ivy markets. They are protective of the character of the place. There has to be a perspective of finding the right use or series of uses for this beautiful structure alongside the originator's um, vision. The hope that the community share is that whatever happens with the Ivy Markets going forward, that the community will be involved in a meaningful consultation. So the hope is that everyone can get together and agree on a repurposing of the beautiful space to bring back the original glory of the existing structure and obviously to serve the people with a contemporaneous use, something that's really purposeful for the 2020s. I really would love to see the markets come back, back to life, back to social purpose and back to being at the centre of their community. I hope one day they will open again, because I would like my grandchildren and great-grandchildren to experience the, the pleasures that we had in the Ivy Market. The Four Courts is probably the most recognised building in Ireland, uh, whether it's from TV news reports, uh, court reports, back of bank notes, the front of car and matchboxes. Um, in fact, it's so ubiquitous that most of us probably don't really look at it. I remember even as a kid looking at the back of the £20 note. It's such a beautiful drawing because it's the original drawing. The Four Courts was built between 1786 and 1802, so it took 16 years to put the place together. And it was designed by the leading English-born architect uh, of his time working in Ireland, uh, James Gandon, who came to the city about five years previously in 1781 to design the Custom House. 
it caused a lot of upset at the fact that he slowly began to suck in all the plum jobs, all the major commissions. Most of the buildings that we now know in the city from the Custom House, Four Courts, the King's Inns, alterations to the Rotunda Hospital, uh, the House of Lords, Portico, College Street, you name it, he was devouring these projects. If Gandon thought he had a challenging brief at the Custom House, well, he was in for a shock when it came to the Four Courts. He had, I suppose, three major things to grapple with. Number one, the site was very shallow. He had to incorporate a major semi-finished public building designed by another architect, Thomas Cooley, the public record office located at the western side of the site. And then thirdly, this was the only site in the entire Liffey scape that was sited right on the bend in the river, which meant that the main palace front of the building would be out of view in the eastern, more commercial part of the city. There's often been discussion about what precedent influenced Gandon in the Four Courts, the concept. Of course, he would have been familiar with St. Paul's Cathedral in London, where he grew up. He would have seen drawings of the new Pantheon, what became the Pantheon in Paris. But I suppose ultimately the spirit of the Four Courts and probably what influenced Gandon most of all is this romantic idea that Piranesi captured in his engravings and drawings and paintings throughout the 18th century of former civilizations, of ruined buildings and landscapes. In the Four Courts we have this monumental drum which is shrouded in neoclassical finery, so there's an elegance to it. But its rawness, the monumentality of it, and the shallow saucer dome, it's not a full hemisphere as we're used to in, in European domes, so it evokes an ancient civilization and there's a, a poeticness to it. And that kind of delicious contrast between that neoclassical finery and the robustness of that, from a distance, creates the most perfect silhouette. It's monumental, it's raw, and it's instantly memorable. Another beautiful feature of the front elevation of the building is the apse that's positioned right behind the portico. So when you go in behind the pillars, you're in another semi-curved space before you actually enter into the building itself. He curved uh, the back wall uh, of the portico, which gives a, a beautiful entrance sequence as you're entering into the building and the great rotunda hall in the centre of the Four Courts is only made great by the fact that the vestibule that you walk through to get into it is small. It conditions you from the great expanse of the outdoors as you walk through into the portico, into this small space, and then bam! It's a railway station. It's a railway station 50 years before its time. It's a great public milling space. It's hard for, from the modern sensibility to think that all of the courtrooms originally communicated directly with the Great Hall. So the grand columnar screens that frame each of the entrances to the courtrooms effectively framed the access points. These were later shrouded by curtains and now they're framed by solid walls. But originally it was much more Roman uh, in inspiration. So the courts communicated uh, with the public realm of the Great Rotunda and the Rotunda itself was sunken lower than the courts. So there was an elegant ascent of steps up to each of the courtrooms. The four courts were the four principal courts in the late 18th century. King's Bench, Common Pleas, Chancery and Exchequer. And Ganton incorporated these like the segments of an orange within the main block of the four courts. We also forget this was a secular building. You know, it wasn't an ecclesiastical building. Well, this is a temple to the Irish judiciary to make a statement in the heart of the city. The bombardment in 1922 had really a devastating impact on the building. Not only had most of the western arm of the building been exploded out, but the sheer array of bullet spray across the front of the building caused huge damage. The fire that effectively consumed most of its contents had a huge impact on the fabric of the stonework and the iron clamps that were holding the building together. We really have the principal architect of the OPW, TJ Byrne, to thank 
for persuading uh, W.T. Galsgrave that the building could be saved. Well, I suppose T.J. Byrne would be a hero of mine, and he's a hero of a lot of architects in OPW because he, he was very, very cognizant of his role also. And you'd have to remember at that time in the 1920s, to take a particular stance on something is a very dangerous thing to do. He felt that it was important to preserve this building and to actually engage with how you would get it to struggle on into some sort of continuity into a new Ireland. He felt strongly enough about it to actually stand up for it as a piece of architecture. TJ Byrne employed the, the new technology of the day was to use cement rather than lime probably the largest concrete pour ever undertaken in Ireland to cast the dome uh, approximately within the silhouette of Gandon's original. Unfortunately, the consequences of that is that many of the ferrous metals that were embedded in that to reinforce the concrete have uh, been subject to water ingress and to deterioration. This building is two centuries old. It needs care. It is a really robust, strong, well-built building, but it has had some big shocks in its life. A hundred years ago, the building was shelled and then gutted by fire. A lot of the stone was replaced, but the stone capitals were retained. Damaged parts were put facing into the drum and the parts that were okay were facing out towards the public they have really taken a battering from the fire and the shelling and they've also had the weather damage over the last hundred years. We needed to find the right skilled masons to recreate those capitals. The biggest challenge of putting the new capitals in was to get them up to the top of the dome. We had the stone capitals driven up early in the morning before the court service started, brought in through the front door, up through the ceiling, through the existing opening in the ceiling, wheeled over to one of the windows that was taken out of the drum, up the scaffolding to the top of the column, and then very carefully manoeuvred to the top of the column, a bit like a surgeon. Remnants of a blue sky were found on the inner face of the concrete capping. As part of the repairs, um, there was some remedial works done uh, to the dome and then the night sky was reinstated. It's always fantastic when you uh, come across a little piece of the history that has been forgotten and when you uh, dig a little deeper, do a bit of research, uh, it, it re-emerges. One of the most exciting parts of the project has been the opportunity to work with the original drawings. The drawings that Gandon's team would have created. So there's this straight line all the way back, which connects us all. I have access to his drawings. I can look at the people who worked for him. I can see their actual, line, actual lines on a page. And that is a language, it's like a symphony. When I look at the drawings, when I look at James Gandon's drawings, when anybody looks at them, that is an international language. It's plan, it's section, it's elevation, there are measurements on it, and they're as valid today as the day the person sat there with the quail or whatever. They have left a legacy for us. They also have left their thoughts and dreams about how the building would be constructed. It's really important to point out that this building is a survivor. We're passing it every day. It survived the adversary of, of the Civil War, and is still serving the original function for which it was built. There's such potential in the setting of the four courts and indeed the entire length of the Liffey to give it back to people, to have a public promenade in a way that allows us to take a breather, to actually stop and admire the setting and the legacy and the inheritance of the 18th century city. But honestly, the four courts has it. It just has it in spades.
Designing buildings in the same place has a magnetic attraction, I think, for architects. You've seldom a choice in what you get to build, but if you live and work in a place, you do get opportunities to build more than once in the same place. And over time, it builds up to a sort of a response to the place that you're in. Dublin's a big city. It's not one place, it's a whole series of places. It's the, it's the motorway, it's industrial estates, it's, it's housing, it's parks. Uh, um, but what's interested me has always been uh, its context, the bay, the mountains and the centre, the old 18th century centre, which is underused, rotting, still haven't come to a proper way of dealing with it. When you come to look at Dublin from above, there is a, a drama about flying over the city because you often fly over the bay first or you see the bay at the end and things open out. I think all cities are like, they're, they're like a geography. It, they're just like a field or a mountain range. You, you come to build something on them and you have to place it in some way in it with the furrow of it or maybe against the furrow of it. It doesn't matter, you just have to do something that understands the place that you're in. We worked on Temple Park Gallery and Studios and it was uh, an old factory that we wrapped uh, a new building around, but that became a kind of a plinth on which we put an extra story uh, made of metal of artist studios. It was an enlivening thing on the, on the roofscape of the city. There were people up there. The plan of it from the air is actually a Juan Gris painting. It was meant to celebrate that, get people up there and out and balconies looking out over the city. In many cities, the fifth facade is the roof. It's looking down on the building. The roof plane in other cities is full of life and you think of the roofs of Paris or other places like that. Uh, in Dublin, when you look down on the city, and you look at old photographs of it, when it was based on the Georgian increment, there was this wonderful character of, of, of continually serrated, gabled, hipped roofs that ran for miles of slate. You can still see some of it, uh, with brick chimneys all the way down. It's an absolutely beautiful thing. Lines of terraces that went back for miles. A lot of that has been rebuilt in kind of a boxy, flat way. And when you fly over it, in my own experience, it's a lot of air conditioning plant. There's no life up there. There are many regulations that are stopping people living at the upper level of the buildings. It's not the great experience that it should be. The dental hospital in Lincoln Place uh, was a connection between five Georgian buildings. Uh, they're connected internally by a series of corridors, like a piece of jewellery. It's, it's, it's a tiny, incisive piece of work. It's not famous or huge, but it's a thing that cities should be full of. The kind of thing you, you see as you pass on a bus you look in the window and you go, I, I wonder what that is. And on the roof, um, the dental hospital wanted a library and didn't think they had the space for it. But we put five pods on the back of the five buildings and the geometry of the Georgian buildings gave the geometry of the pods. The roofscape of the city was enlivened and you were up amongst things that are rough like chimneys and slates that aren't normally visible to people. If you stand back, Dublin's most interesting point, that at the centre of it, there's a university. And that's a very unusual thing in any city. It's not a palace or it's not a, a, a park. Um, it's a seat of learning. And um, that's totally conscious. It was totally conscious in the ideas of the people who built and laid out the city. At the centre, there'd be something that represented um, uh, civilization and improvement. And Trinity is a grid of buildings surrounded by green, surrounded by a wall, which is surrounded by all this mass of streets which are bent and folded over in different shapes and lines. And all these bent streets and different buildings, they look in at this extraordinary uh, uh, rational grid in the middle of a green space, which is their ideal. That's unique, there's nothing else like that. We've been lucky enough to work in Trinity playing with that grid and in making buildings which deal with the edge of Trinity. We've, we've made gateways, and at the moment we're, we're, we're making one in, in Printing House Square uh, off Pier Street. It's, it takes up a courtyard form. It sits uh, behind the, the old printing house, the 18th century printing house. And so we form the roof almost like a kind of a mountain range, or like a snapshot of a series of Georgian roofs with all those kind of serried ranks. But essentially it was a kind of a folding form, like a Baroque form, like an animal coiled around the courtyard that folded over and down and came down behind the printing house. 
there is an enormously increased interest in architecture, generally, in the population. What's definitely true for young architects is the lack of opportunity through lack of competition. That's for sure. That's there. And there's way too much emphasis on the particularity of experience having to lead on to other experience. That's not the way architects are trained. You're trained to think of um, an issue and a brief and come up with a solution. And the fresher you are, probably the better the solution. Architecture is political. Young architects are given a great opportunity, I think, by their education and training to contribute ideas. There are a hundred interesting ways that I've seen around the world that architects can make huge social impact with small ideas that are design-based, but are also socially based, but that come out of the architectural mind.